Welcome to the Proceedings Podcast. I'm Bill Hamblett, the Editor-in-Chief of Proceedings at the Naval Institute, and this is Day 2 at Tailhook in Reno at the famous Nugget. My guest today is uh, Vice Admiral Ken Weitzel. He is the Air Boss, otherwise known as Commander Naval Air Forces, also Commander Naval Air Forces Pacific. And sir, you've had that job now for three years. Three years. Uh, there was mention last night in the industry reception about your impending retirement, yep. so that's coming up quick. Yep. So in three years as Air Boss, uh, what have been um, you know some of your major priorities, and, and which ones have gone well, and which ones will you hand off to your relief? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, you know, for remember at the start, when I rolled in in October of 2020, we were still in the recovery phase of COVID, as well as we couldn't lose any of the uh, the mission accomplishment because we were still sending carriers out, sending expeditionary squadrons out, and there was no capacity whatsoever to uh, uh, to miss a beat and not satisfy the four deployments that we had to do. So. Uh, I think our best, our, our biggest accomplishment uh, at that early phase was getting our getting our sailors, our chiefs, our officers, uh, and our and our civil servants through COVID-19 without missing a beat. We started off with one platform that was making mission capability uh, rates under the the project that we started. And today, which, which we're, one was that? Uh, it was the ENF uh, F-18 uh, Super Hornet ENFs. And this morning I got up uh, 9 of 12 now, so we've rolled 11 more uh, type model series into the mission capability uh, naval sustainment system aviation, performed a plan. We've moved them into the system, this holistic system that we've got, and now we've, uh, we're have we up to 9 of 12 or MC, or more importantly, 12 aircraft, 12 type model series are in um, the maintenance operations center, uh, and we've just in three years, not only have the people recovered, but our aircraft have recovered, and we're at a readiness uh, level that we have never had in naval aviation before. So I'm pretty proud of that. You know, that is a there is no finish line for that. It's uh, r- relentless as we maintain those platforms. We've now scoped it to full mission capability. Um, so that is I'm handing over a good thing for them. I'm handing over uh, an incomplete work. Uh, as we try to make Sinatra, Chief of Naval Air Training, healthy. Uh, and we, because we have lo- uh, lost a little bit of focus on our training aircraft, uh, we've developed a significant backlog of students down in Pensacola. Uh, so we're etching away that backlog, and we're in a transition phase. So while our gray aircraft, our fighter aircraft, our uh, fleet aircraft are in mission capability, now we've moved the orange and white, the Sinatra aircraft, uh, into, uh, into that too. We've had a couple of uh, Black Swan uh, events with the T-45, with compressor blades coming apart, physiological events back in uh, the 2010 time frame, and we've worked our way through those. So that's what I'm handing off to my, unfortunately, I'm handing off to my predecessor based on time. We're on the right path, but based on time frame, I just, uh, you know, I'm going to leave before I solve it. Last night you mentioned uh, you need like 250 or so new Super Hornet pilots per year, Yep. and you're producing less than that. It's like 210 or something? 200. This is what we're on glide path for uh, right now. So, <clears throat> if you remember uh, T forty five, so in jet training, we had uh, we had an issue, you know, five or six years ago with physiological events. The, then we the had O-box, an issue. The, the O-box, O-box, oxygen, oxygen yep. generation system. It really wasn't the oxygen. The oxygen content in the scrubber uh, for the O-box system was given the percentage of oxygen was fine. What we found out is it was a holistic solution for that, <clears throat> not only in how the students were maintaining their physical, uh, you know, they're going out, you can't go out and run in Kingsville in a hundred degree day and then come in dehydrated. So it was a holistic solution, how they were taking care of themselves, which they're healthy anyway. And then we, uh, probably the best is we paired with NASA on this. We found out that uh, airborne, when we were uh, fighting the aircraft and you come back to idle, uh, there wasn't enough pressure coming through the mask to, to, to allow the students wasn't the concentration of oxygen, it was the pressure. So now they're an engineering solution, and when the throttles are at idle airborne, an extra 2 to 3% throttle or RPM is now forced in. So you go to idle, increase the idle RPM for that, and now the pressure uh, that the students are getting and the IPs are getting. So that was, uh, uh, that was solved there. The reason, so that was the first Black Swan event. The second Black Swan event was low-pressure 
or high pressure blades, compressor blades had failed and were uh, exiting catastrophically through the engine encasement. Then we had a quality escape out of the engine and low pressure blade. Uh, we had a low pressure blade at the at the hold short go through. And when we found out that that was so, uh, we found out that. And now we had to go back through and re-engineer and re-inspect all of the blades. So we had three black swan events in the T forty five. In the T forty five only. This is jet training. All the other training uh, is at one hundred and five percent production. But I need two hundred and fifty two this year in twenty three. Need a 252 strike fighter pilots trained for Navy and the Marine Corps, and this year we're on glide path to, to build 200. So we have we have established uh, break glass initiatives to ramp up production, redo the syllabus, uh, uh, get locations, bird uh, bash the the bird uh, hazard condition down in Kingsville and Meridian because the migratory pattern was was bad. So now we've got debt locations and we're standing up a permanent bet debt in, uh, in El Centro. We're hiring contract pilots to come on. Remember, if I don't make these first students, our, our path is to fill first fleet seats. So for 10 years, I haven't been able to fill first fleet seats. Three years later, all of those pilots come and become instructor pilots. So I've got a shortage of instructor yeah, pilots. Of IPs, yeah. So I've got to be able to build uh, build the uh, build those at 252. Next year's uh, in 24, it's 267. So we have a huge mountain to climb uh, to get back on step, finishing 23, and then going into 24. Yesterday, uh, the, the CEO of VT2 stopped by, yeah. uh, and he mentioned that his instructor pilots are flying six days a week, two missions a day. To make, to make pilots, so there, there's a lot going on. To, there is, as you said, to, to get after that uh, pilot shortage. Yep. Um, so, sir, 39 years in the Navy, yep. uh, three years as Air Boss. Um, between your time as Air Boss and also your time as F-14 pilot, F-18 pilot, you commanded a, uh, a carrier air wing. Mm -hmm. You commanded a carrier strike group. Yep. Um, as you look back, things you're most proud of. Uh, probably most, uh, you know, I go through each one of the tours. The first tour, we had great uh, commanding officers and a, a ton of and great friends, uh, to include Admiral Aquilino, who's now a commander of uh, Indo PACOM. Uh, and we stayed in because we uh, we had we had fun, we enjoyed each other, uh, and it was a, just a ton of fun being uh, being in the F-14 uh, as we rolled through. Both of the tours, the command tour was spectacular. We had the first Fs in quantity, Super Hornet Fs, two seats to roll off the line, so I was able to have the first squadron uh, there. And then jumping in George Herbert Walker Bush, the way President Bush and the family supported that carrier and taking on a combat deployment. Uh, we were there, liberated Mosul. Uh, as we were doing strikes from Syria, as well as strikes coming up from uh, uh, from the Gulf. Uh, there, was, there was Operation Inherit Resolve. Yeah, yeah. And so uh, did absolutely phenomenal. Very proud of uh, uh, of that effort and um, and the JOs flying for that. And then uh, Strike Group Four became the training uh, admiral on the East Coast. Was phenomenal. Then I took the Pacific to be Deputy uh, uh, PACOM, uh, Deputy Pack Fleet, and then. I'm culminating in the best job in the Navy for a guy in a flight suit. I'm wearing pajamas today, so I'll go out. I came in the Navy wearing a flight suit, and I'm going to leave the Navy uh, wearing a flight suit. So uh, I've been uh, had a very blessed, Melody and I have had a very, very blessed time in uh, uh, naval aviation-centric uh, job, so it's, uh, it's been fun. Uh Air Wing of the Future, you talked about that a little bit last night. There's a lot of conversation here on the floor at Tailhook about Air Wing of the Future, the platforms that are coming online. So some big changes underway right now, right? So you got Block 3 Super Hornets coming yep. out. Yep. you got F-35 being integrated uh, in the Air Wings. Uh, the first squadron just came back from deployment on Vincent, or was that? Late last Navy, year, early, second Navy. squadron, BMFA yeah. 314, came back off of Abraham Lincoln yep. with a 10-plane squadron. You got CMV-22, yep. so the Osprey that's been converted yep. to yep. Navy use for COD, yep. right, yep. carrier right. onboard delivery. Uh, and you've got the uh, MQ-25, the unmanned tanker, yep. slash what, whatever else it might morph into. We'll add more stuff to coming that. In. How, yeah, talk about each one of those platforms 
uh, how you know are they on time on delivery yeah. and you know how, how's it changing how the air wings think about themselves and integrate with the carrier strike group uh, and other capabilities yeah for us as we've got is this fight uh, this high-end fight goes into uh, do a, a level of complexity that I've never seen in my career you know the focus for us is become a joint integrated force that can meld into all of the war fighting capabilities from seabed all the way up uh, all the way up to space so one of the platforms you didn't mention was e2d the, the digital uh, array uh, capability out of e2d and the plat you know it is the quarterback uh, of the carrier strike group as it melds in uh, to that fight I was glad you mentioned CMV-22. You know, it it initially took on the the role just as a one-for-one -one replacement uh, for the COD, but we've completely blown the concept of operations uh, up for COD, for uh, CMV-22, and it's going to turn into a, an offensive and defensive weapon uh, uh, for us. The F-35 has been a game changer. The Charlie variants uh, for that. I already said TAC air integration with the Marine Corps with VMFA-314, VFA-97 was our second transition squadron and now we are upgunning the next deployment on Benson from a 10 plane squadron to a 14 plane squadron and that's uh, all to get you know more fifth generation uh, capabilities forward and then the other one uh, that we didn't mention uh, was the Growler. We're getting ready to go with CAG-9, we'll send them with Growler capability mod uh, and the next generation jammer jamming pod was delivered to VAQ Wing Pacific uh, two weeks ago. So we're constantly, as well as the Block 3 Super Hornets, that'll be the first deployment with VF VMFA-113 uh, coming up here in about a month. So the progression of the air wing of the future is so that we can, uh, so we can conduct that worldwide fight uh, if we have to, specifically in the Western Pacific. How about weapons? So one of the big yeah. lessons from, uh, you know, operations in Ukraine was at the start, Everyone was like, okay, hey, we got to pump out more weapons, you know, everything from, uh, you know, artillery weapons up to smart weapons and UAVs, all those kinds of things. How, how does the naval aviation enterprise sit in terms of weapons procurement, the, the future capabilities that you need on the aircraft? Yeah, the weapons on the drawing board and the weapons that are going uh, into industry right now and being produced, uh, you know, we're about a year behind on the quantity that we want. The quality of the weapons is exactly what we need for the next fight. And then the weapons that we already have in the, uh, in the stockpile can let us fight across multiple multiple regimes. Vice Admiral Satan Khan, uh, Scott Khan was, uh, you know, uh, another buddy of, uh, of ours at N9. He realized that we were... We were slightly behind on quantity and quality of high-end weapons uh, needed uh, for this next fight. And about a year and a half ago, he energized the, both industry as well as he energized S1 OpNav on the need for those weapons. So upgrading a, uh, uh, AMRAM, uh, Lorazm is going to be in larger quantities on, the, on this deployment follow-on air-to-air weapons that are going to give us the, the superiority in the air that we needed to have. Those are coming uh, off the production line. So I uh, kind of like Admiral Paparo stated during his 60 minutes, you know, I'm not, I'm, uh, I'm confident in our capabilities today, uh, but, you know, I'm never, never going to be complacent uh, and I'm never going to be happy with what we've got. Uh, so the pace has got to pick up and we are depending on industry to do that. Got it. Uh, so I remember, you know, coming up on on time here, but I remember when your predecessor turned over, you know, the, the Admiral uh, Chip Miller, Bullet yeah. Miller, right? He, he had a huge focus on uh, F-18 Super Hornet readiness and the, the number 341. 341. And, you know, getting to 341 mission-capable jets. Um, where do you stand in terms of, is that, is that the number still, or is the number increased, and how's that, how's that going? Yeah, that's a good question. So uh, 341 was the first line in the sand as we moved into NSSA, performed a plan. What we found out is, you know, based on deployment schedules, that number varies by a few. So our first, the first thing is we upgun based on the analytics that we did, it was we needed 352, and we have numbers established for every single type model series. So 352 plus or minus one or two, depending on where squadrons are in the OFRP, 
determines what we need every month. Today I woke up with 367 mission capable uh, Super Hornets. I have a number for every type model series on what they need to have. More importantly, the culture. It's not just chasing a number. The culture is percolated down to the squadrons. It's percolated to industry. It's percolated to the seven pillars that maintain Naval Sustainment uh, System Aviation Performance Plan. The culture is percolated and everybody knows we have a North Star to work to. Uh, so, you know, it's good to talk about ENF because they were our test bed. They have performed spectacularly. But what I'm really proud is, is we've moved across every type model series now. So readiness from across the fleet, across all your different platforms, and it's a, it's a focus. Sounds like every single day you get briefed on how many aircraft of all the TMSs yep. are up and where you are on that, on that uh, readiness. I get an email. Uh, I wake up every morning at midnight. So the automated data tools uh, do the analysis, and every single morning across every type model series, uh, it kicks in at midnight, and I get up every morning on the West Coast, and I see exactly the state and the readiness of the uh, Naval Air Force every single day, and it's the focus every single day. I brief my boss, Admiral Paparo, uh, every Tuesday afternoon on, uh, on the strength of our force. I can tell you very, you know, and, and this is not... You know, no braggartry or anything of that. We are, uh, we are, we are ready to go into the next uh, to the next event. First of all, we want to have the force to deter a fight. But if we're uh, if the if the threat drives us into a fight, naval aviation will respond with incredible strength. All right, sir. Last question. Yeah. Uh, advice for JOs today. So you're you're getting ready to, to yeah. retire. Thirty nine years ago, you started you know flying and flying F 14s and then F 18s. <laughs> So what would uh, Vice Admiral Air Boss tell Ensign uh, Weitzel you know, 39 years ago? Yeah, number one, uh, what we were working on is you know, we had great CO leadership, but they had high expectations for us. We were expected to be expert technicians uh, in our platform, uh, and we were held accountable on how we progress. So the first thing, and they're doing a, the junior officers are doing a phenomenal job right now, is being experts in your trade. We will not know when the next event, when the next kinetic event ticks off. So they are going to be, they'll respond uh, with or without certification uh, uh, going into the next event. And then the last thing, uh, the second one is equally important is have fun. My log, I've got five log books. I, I have no problem saying that I jumped into as many flights I had as I could. Uh, and I just, I love flying. Uh, I love the camaraderie with uh, uh, First Squadron and going to the RAG, uh, but I also knew what was expected of me and, uh, and with the folks around me. We were expected to be uh, experts in aerial war fighting, and we were, uh, and we, uh, we played hard, but we worked hard too. All right, sir. Well, my guest has been Vice Admiral Ken Weitzel. He is the Air Boss, Commander of Naval Air Forces. This is day two at Tailhook. Uh, thanks for stopping by, sir, thanks, and thanks Bill. for your time, and congrats on uh, a successful tour and thanks. also a successful, hugely successful and very long career as well. Uh, thank you very much. It's good. All right. Until next episode, which will be tomorrow here at Tailhook, remember, victory begins at the Naval Institute.